सहना सहनौ भुनक्तु सह वीर करवाह तेजस्वीनावदी तमस्तु मिदिषावह शांति 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 There is a letter from uh, advocate uh, Ganesh Sharma. Now he is. Uh, I hope he's here. He has asked uh, a question uh, or clarification. On the first day, I did say that. Um, We should not need weekends and vacation. Why do people need weekends and vacation? I did say that. To which he is asking, it is a sort of a recreation, we need a change, etc. Now, very humbly he is putting a wrong, he is not challenging it. He says, uh, how can we not have a weekend or vacation? Some vacation we need as a relief. Now, when I said that you should not need a vacation, I did not say that you should not take a vacation. There's a lot of difference. Hmm? You could take a vacation. So it is something like this. Now, occasionally, you take your family and go out and have a meal somewhere. You could go to a Udipi restaurant, you could go to a Chinese restaurant, you can go to a Mexican restaurant, just a change you may go. But it should not be that the food at home is so terrible and you can't stand the food, and therefore you're going. Food is excellent, there's no complaints of food, you're very happy with what you are having at home, and occasionally you may want to go. There is no objection to that. Now what I said is, the state of affairs is that the food is terrible. Even the animals, when you give it, it doesn't eat. That is the condition of the food. And then you go out to eat. Then something wrong with it. Similarly here, you action, you get frustrated, tired, fatigued with action. With action, and therefore you need a weekend or a vacation. That is wrong. You enjoy the action. You are perfectly happy performing the action, and occasionally you you go out somewhere, take a holiday. There's nothing wrong with it. So you slightly, the gentleman slightly misunderstood what I said. So if you understand it that way. You, you would not need a holiday, you may take a holiday. And you need a holiday, he himself says in the letter, we get some relief. Relief means that you are bored, you are fatigued. The fact that you say relief, you relief from what? From stress. You sh work should not stress you. That's the point. So, a person who is, follows the wheel of action, he says, that wheel of action set forth. Now if you function in a spirit of yajna, everything goes in order. The more you work, the more energized you become. 
the more energy you have. So it doesn't fatigue you. It doesn't tire you. So that would be the case where you work in a spirit of yajna, in a spirit of service and sacrifice. That should be your attitude towards work. And that makes a world of difference. The moment your work turns self-centered, selfish, you get fatigued, you get tired, and the work suffers. So all that he said is work in a spirit of yajna right up to uh, verse 16. So if he doesn't follow, anybody who doesn't follow this principle, he lives in sin. Sin meaning he's all the time agitated, worried and anxious. And then he lives in vain in the sense he doesn't evolve. He's only gathering more, more vasanas in this world. The purpose for which you're born in this world is to exhaust the vasanas. Each one of you have a particular life suited best, so don't complain. You, know, you may look at somebody else and say he is better off. There's no such thing. Each person, even if you are in a terrible condition, you're born in a terrible condition, that is best suited for your evolution. Otherwise, you would not be born that. Because every time the bundle of desires for exhaustion seeks its own embodiment and environment. So you got an embodiment and environment most suitable to you. Apparently, you don't understand why is it in such a condition. But you must make the best use of that embodiment and environment for your evolution rather than devolution. So if you work self-centeredly, you devolve. If you work in a spirit of yajna, you evolve. That's all that happens. And a person who reached the highest state of self-realization or God-realization is giving a picture of that person in 17 and 18. 17, which we did yesterday, and 18 today. A person who is tushtihi, truptihi, ratihi. All three words means gratification, satisfaction, contentment, delight. A person who is satisfied. Why three, three uh, uh, times he repeats is because three ways that you are trying to find satisfaction through the body, through the mind, through the intellect. You don't have to. So you can find your happiness within yourself. There is no such thing as happiness extrovertedly. You can't find joy or happiness extrovertedly. And yet you are seeking. So a simple example would be, remember this. Now your point is, all of you will argue rightly, look here, sir, I like a particular type of food. I go to that particular restaurant. I enjoy eating it. And you say there is no joy or pleasure in the external world. How can you say that? As I gave you an example of a boy who is interested in a particular partner and he has been struggling for years to get that partner after many years the he succeeds there's a great enjoyment and to say that externally there's no enjoyment it doesn't make sense it could be anything you like to go to a particular music performance and that particular artist is in town and you go 
You purchase the tickets with your family, you thoroughly enjoy the music performance, and yet we say there is no joy in the external world of objects. How is it possible? I'll give you a small example. Think about it. So on a moonlit night, on a full moon, a family sits and enjoys the moonlight. So the man claims, look here, sit down and enjoy with me. See the beautiful moonlight coming from the moon. He sees the light coming from the moon. He experiences it. He enjoys it thoroughly. My question to you is, is the light coming from the moon? What's your answer? Is light coming from the moon? No light is coming from the moon. It's arid land and dust there. Why do you say there's no light from the moon? Because that man says, look here, you, you see, I see the light coming from the moon, I'm experiencing it, I'm enjoying it. How can you say there's no light coming from the moon? You are educated, he's uneducated. You've got the knowledge, you understand there is no light coming from the moon, period. Anybody can claim anything, you know it. Similarly, the moment you gain knowledge, that is why I'm asking you to read and read and read. If you gain knowledge, you will understand where is the joy content in life, not in the external world which you are blindly chasing. It doesn't come from there. You believe it because you see it, you experience it, you enjoy it. And like that illiterate fellow, you are spiritual ignoramuses declaring so. But once you get spiritually educated, you will understand instantly there is no joy coming from that external source and therefore you will not dwell in it. It's as simple as that. Think about it. It's your reflection. It's your own just as the, it is a reflector light. It's the sunlight that is coming. Similarly, your own Atman, reflection is what you're enjoying. Not, it's not in the objects. So, therefore you find that ideal person here completely satisfied in himself, by himself. And he doesn't have to do anything further for his joy or satisfaction. 18. For him, there is no interest whatsoever here in what is done or what is not done. For him means for a perfect human being who has reached the state of God-realization or self-realization. An enlightened soul has no interest whatsoever in what is to be done or what is not to be done. Nor does he depend upon any being for any object. He is totally self-sufficient. He is not dependent upon anything that the world provides because he is paripurna. Paripurna means totally fulfilled. You can ask him anything, he is not interested. Sir, unfortunately we have no time, but there are parables and parables in the Shastras which describe such persons fascinating person, they describe such persons who are completely fulfilled. They find it difficult. You go and ask them what you want. They, it's not that they're trying to impress you. They genuinely don't want. 
And even if they take anything from you, they, they're not interested. It is like river entering an ocean. It doesn't make any difference to him. A river entering the ocean does not increase the ocean. The water doesn't arise there. It, the mighty Ganges, the mighty Amazon, the Mississippi, the Nile are pouring millions and millions of gallons of water into the sea. The sea is not any change at all. Similarly, whatever you give him, whatever you offer, whatever is done or not done, doesn't make the slightest difference to a perfect human being. If he has reached that state of self-realization. Sir, it is something like this. When you have realized the self, How would you look at the world? Uh, that's what he's talking about here. It's not dependent upon any object or being. It is like you, after waking up, if you enter a dream, you've got to imagine. Suppose you, uh, you had a dream and you wake up and you enter a dream. How would you conduct yourself? Sir, a man in a dream collected money for housing the poor, homeless. For ten years he collected money for serving the poor, for serving the people who had no homes. And after that he built a row of 500 houses with that money, 10 years collection and 500 houses were built. Then he located 500 homeless people. Everything now is set. The buildings have been made, the houses have been made, the homeless people have been located, so he called the governor of the state to distribute the documents. And the whole stage is set. Where? Huh? Don't forget that. It's all in the dream. He is dreaming like that. And when the car, the governor's car came, he rushed. He tripped, woke up. <laughs> Will that man want to get back to the dream at least to hand over the documents? So much, 10 years he's been collected. All the fellows are there. Uh, houses are there. The people are there. The governor has come. At least, he doesn't care about himself. Document, at least somebody distributed. Will he want to go and at least hand over the documents? Yes or no? If you say yes, go to a psychiatrist. <laughs> Any fellow who had said yes, he needs a psychiatrist. Something wrong. After getting up, nothing matters. What is done or not done, and it doesn't depend upon any being for anything. It is paripurna. What? It's a, it's a different world altogether. Just this waking world and dream world. You yourself go through that. Now you think dreamer is somebody else. No, you yourself is the dreamer. You yourself have become the waker now. Now you are rejecting the dream. Hey, why are you talking about dream? Swamiji saw, talk something about the waking state. This is exactly what you say when you are dreaming. He says, if I say, look here, you are in, you say you are in poverty, you are jobless and all that. I say, listen, you are an extremely well-to-do person and you are comfortable, you have got a beautiful home, you are sleeping in air-conditioned comfort. The, the, the dreamer, when you are dreaming that you are in poverty, 
you will not understand what I'm saying. If at all a dream guru comes and tells you, look here, you are well off, you are sleepy in a beautiful apartment, in air condition, you are not uh, pauper. He said, what are you talking? I have no food to eat, I am starving, I am suffering, and you say I am this and that. You will not understand. You totally reject that suggestion. And when you are in the waking state, you reject the dream. So, those people who have reached the fourth plane of consciousness, God is not something hanging there in the clouds, nor is he locked in a temple or church or mosque. What amount of trouble people take to go to the hills. There's nothing in the hills except monkeys and wild animals. No, you go right up to the hills and pray and pray for what? I'm not against prayer. Many people start writing to me, they said, why are you against prayer? Why are you against temples? Why are I am not against temples. I'm only telling you that you are going there to find something which is not there. You know, there's a great saint called Elisha. Elisha, the saint, went round the world to find God. When she went round the world and completely exhausted, she probably went to all the churches and all the everything religious, she went on pilgrimage and ultimately she came back. She was very, very sincere to find out. She did not go to a church to ask for something. Now we go for only asking something. But she wanted to find out where is, where is God, she went. And then she found there is no God anywhere. She came back. And the moment she sat in her house, a voice said to her, Saint Alicia, I am here. Now, don't wait for the, it's only symbolic, please. No voice comes and tells you. Now you are waiting for the voice. Uh, you may take a stethoscope and start feeling a voice. You understand? Don't, it's only symbolic, saying that she found it within herself. And therefore, this is the, the fourth plane of consciousness. You are going through three planes of consciousness, waking state of consciousness, which you are in now, experiencing the waking world. And when you enter the dream, you become the dreamer. Now you are the waker, experiencing the waking world. And when you enter the dream, you become the dreamer, experiencing the dream world. And when you enter into deep sleep, you become the deep sleeper, experiencing nothing. So these are the three states that every one of you know and every one of you are going through from birth to death. Waking, dream, deep sleep. Waking, dream, deep sleep. You know not of any other states. All the three states are conditioned states. They are conditioned, they are not your original state and you are quite complacent, you are quite happy with that state, not knowing you are conditioned. So here is a transaction between unconditioned and conditioned states and there cannot be any communication as is evident. Nothing you seem to understand. Sir, so when you are sober, your friend is drunk and is lying in the streets and when you go and talk to him, my dear friend, I want to take you home. He says, he's lying in the gutter, managing director. He says, this is my home, I invite you. He's inviting you to the gutter. Then you don't want to argue, you get hold of him, he protests. He rebels, but if you have an ounce of feeling for your friend, you'll pick him up and take him home because there is no communication between you and him. You are unconditioned, he is conditioned by the alcohol. This is the problem. A waker and a dreamer cannot talk to the waker. 
neither can the waker talk to the dreamer. There is no communication. Do you understand? Similarly, those who reach the fourth plane of consciousness, the real unconditioned state is the fourth plane. It's called Turiya. Turiya means fourth. That is your real state. You are not the waker as you believe yourself to be. You are not the dreamer. You are not the deep sleeper. You are that self, the Atman in you, which is unconditioned. You are not there now. You are not in the fourth state. And great men come time and again, try to remind you, get to that state, get to your real state. It falls on deaf ears. That is why when you talk about the self, there's hardly anybody. This when I say hardly anybody, even though the whole auditorium is full, this is not Bangalore. It's a small drop in Bangalore. But if you talk about the world, people will be flocking. Thousands and thousands of people will come if you talk about the world. Now here's the talk about the higher self, nothing about the world. Now, you have not reached there, you will not understand. You know, what is the purpose of this talk is to remember that you are the self and function in the world. That's all you can do. And he who does it most successfully, he will be an outstanding individual. But if you are completely attuned to the terrestrial world, you're lost, as you are now. Everybody is lost. He believes that is all that is whatever. His business is going on very well. And Swamiji, business is going on very well. I can see the smile on his face. Beside, behind that smile is terrible agony. He's not pretending. So you are a successful doctor, a successful lawyer, a successful anything. It doesn't make any difference. You could be the prime minister of the country. You are involved in the world. But you must remember that you are the self and function. Nothing affects you thereafter. Sir, so, an actor acts on the stage. Take that example. When an actor acts on the stage, he goes through all those joys and sorrows of the stage, but he has nothing to do with it. Do you understand? Hamlet, his father was killed by his uncle, father's brother, killed him and married his mother within a month. And that's how the play starts. Hamlet starts by Hamlet terribly, terribly upset that he lost his father. He doesn't know that the uncle has killed him, but he suspects something because the uncle married the mother. I is in a terrible state. And then the ghost of his father confirms that his brother had killed him. And Hamlet could not take it. It's all on the stage, yeah? And on the stage he is acting so beautifully. He sits on a precipice, precipice deciding whether it's worth living this life or putting an end to this life. What atrocity that such a noble king as my father has been killed by this wicked fellow, my uncle. And he's married my mother, who's very innocent. She doesn't know what is happening. Within a month, within a month. Is it worth living thereafter? Is this the question? And therefore, the great Hamlet sits on a precipice, deciding whether he should live or die. And that's the time he brings out that famous oration, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it's nobler in the minds to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune to take arms against the sea of trouble. To die, to wake up in some horrid dreams for there's the rub. 
to be or not to be? That is the question. Now on the stage, the man is wanting to commit suicide. He doesn't know what to do. But the Royal Albert Hall in London is absolutely full. That means is a great day for him. Plenty of money. So he has already asked his wife to sit in the front seat because his wedding anniversary of the actor. And he's so happy that he's getting a lot of money. The Royal Albert Hall, the biggest hall there, is full. But on the stage he's saying to be or not to be, that is the question. And towards the end he's signaling his wife. That is the question. Get out because we'll have to catch the bit the traffic. <laughs> Wedding anniversary. So now what I'm trying to say is he keeps that idea clear. I am the uh, the person, Sir Lawrence Olivia, only acting. So whatever happens on the stage doesn't happen to him. And that's that's what he says. For him, there is no interest what is done and what is not done. And he's not dependent on anything because why is the actor not affected by anything? Because he's constantly maintaining his identity. I am Sir Lawrence Olivier. Similarly, friends, you must maintain that consciousness. I am the self and function in the world. Nothing happens. Now, everything is happen happening to you now. Profit goes up, you go up. Profit goes down, you go down. If the, if the family smiles at you, you're happy. If the family frowns at you, you're happy. If there's a telephone call, you're happy. If there's no telephone call, you're miserable. Nobody phones me. Huh? You're dependent on everything. Whether it's bright, you're happy. Whether it's not bright, you're happy. Lecture is nice, nice. Lecture is terrible, you are terrible. Now, why are you bored when the lecture is boring? So, everything you're dependent because you lost your identity. You keep your identity going and function in the world, nothing happens to you. That's what he's saying. Depend upon any being or any object. Hmm. Tasmat means therefore. <clears throat> Throughout the Gita you'll find this word tasmat, tasmat, therefore, means intelligent conclusions after logic and reason. There is no do's and don'ts, there's no thou shalt and thou shalt not. He explains the whole logic, he explains the whole reason, and then comes to an intelligent conclusion, like mathematics. He says tasmat, therefore, what's the conclusion? Right from verse 4. Right from verse 4, he gives the logic here. He says, therefore, always perform samachara, act well. Satatam, satatam means always. Karyam karma, whatever obligatory duties you have to do, you must do it. What is to be done now, to the best of your ability, you do it. If you're a carpenter, do carpentry. If you're a plumber, do plumbing. If you're a teacher, teach. If you're a preacher, preach. That's it. No prefixes, no suffixes to action. Just do what you ought to do and get out. And that's what the same Shakespeare says, all the world is a stage, and all men and women are merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. All the world is a stage. Now why are you building your houses on the stage? Why are you getting involved in the affairs of the stage? Just play your role and get out. And if you violate that, you will be in trouble. Sir, 
you are acting Romeo and Juliet. Romeo, Juliet is a married woman comfortably settled down with the family, husband and children are in front row. And you are Ju uh, Romeo, you are of course unmarried. Actor. And then there is this love scene between Romeo and Juliet. It is the nightingale and not the lark. Romeo says, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Romeo says, lark means morning bird has come, to which Juliet says, it is the nightingale singing, not the lark. He says, it's still night, you don't have to go. Probably they didn't have a timepiece. Huh? To which Romeo says, no, my dear, I'll come again, but today it's daytime, I must go. Whole night they were talking to each other. And then he, he, he's supposed to go away because he says, no, it is not the nightingale. But suppose he gets involved in the girl. I think you're right and stays. <laughs> you can't get involved in anything. You just play your role and get out. All the world is a stage and all men and women are mere players. They have their exits and their entrances. Now you have stayed put completely. Family uh, and friends on the stage you are living permanently. So therefore, karyam karma, whatever your role is, play that role. My role is to teach you these five days Teach, get out. No prefixes or suffixes to this action. No attachment whatsoever. And then therefore he says, asaktaha. Asaktaha means without attachment. Anything you do, get attached. A boy meets a girl, he gets attached. Then you raise a family, you get attached to the family. Then you start a business, you get attached to the business. Then you earn a lot of money, you get attached to the money. Then you're fed up with all this. This will not provide you happiness. It's a question of time. After time, you're fed up with that. What do you do? Join a service club, a rotary club, lions club, tiger club, some club you join. And you get attached to that club. It's a service club. You want to service yourself. And you, you get into the service club because you're fed up with all this. And for a while you do that, and you get fed up with that, ultimately you find a swami, get attached to him, <laughs> and suffocate him. Anything you do, you're doing it with a tremendous attachment. He says, whatever you do, samachara, act gracefully. Karyam karma, whoever does his karyam karma, well, does it well. Satatam, always. It's not a part-time occupation. Every moment you have an obligation, do it. Asaktaha, without attachment. Mm. In the third topic, which we are just starting, it covers five verses, 20 to 24. Here he gives emotional appeals for action. The backdrop is, I've been telling you from the first day, that Arjuna, the great hero, hero is not fighting that battle which he supposed. He's a commander. You must start the battle. Everybody is waiting there. It is a clash of ideologies. Righteousness is fighting unrighteousness and therefore Krishna is a part of it. Unrighteousness and barbarity has taken over the country and the Kauravas were exploiting it and the Pandavas with the help of Krishna appealed to them several times and they did not stand to any reason and therefore the war was inevitable. And that war was a clash between ideologies, righteousness fighting unrighteousness. But this fellow collapsed on the field. 
he got so involved in the activity that he could not undertake that role. So Krishna is talking to him and he gave this 4 to 19 chaste logic and reason, as you can see, why he should act. Nahikaschit chanam apijatutishtatya karma krit khadyate yavasya karma. So he says, uh, Krishna, uh, Arjuna, you, not a minute you can stay without rest. You must act for heaven's sake. You can't get away from action. Niyatam kuru karma tvam karma jahyo. You must do your obligated duty. All this he gives uh, the logic and reason for 16 verses, 4 to 19. And anybody with an ounce of sense would have understood the importance of action. But the Arjuna is still sitting down. Hmm? Limp. Now what to do? So now he gives emotional appeals. He wakes up. That fellow needed the emotional treatment. So first he appealed 16 verses to the head. Now he appeals to the heart. First he appealed to the intellect, now he appeals to the mind. Sir, you must understand that to get on in life, you must talk the language of the person you're, you're, you're meeting. Invariably you make a blunder, whether you're doing business or you're dealing with your employees, whether you're dealing with your family, it is very important that you address them in that language, the, the language that they understand. You can't say, sir, I know only French and I will talk in French, but you're talking to a German. A German, that fellow doesn't understand a word of French, and what you're saying is pure sense, but nothing goes in. Similarly, if you're talking the logic, or if you're talking the language of logic and reason, it will not appeal to a person who is emotional, vice versa. If you're talking the language of emotion to a person who is logic and reason, it won't understand. Invariably, you make a mistake. Even with your children, you'll talk logic when they need emotion, You'll do, deal with emotion when they need logic. Not to talk about husband and wife. Therefore, everything breaks. Husband and wife breaks. They're getting on because there's no other way. In the Western countries, they're part, company. And children also just put up with the nonsense. Because you're not talking in the same wavelength. So he comes down to uh, emotional Sir, as you all know that I have, I have, I am running an academy called the Vedanta Academy, uh, where I'm running three-year residential courses for students between 18 and 30. So all of you are disqualified. Don't worry. So therefore, you know, because I'm not going to take you, because the average age is 65 years. Between 18 and 30, I take. Um, so, I have a problem that it's an academy, it's like any other university. Now, first, the parents, invariably, I would say over 50% of the parents don't uh, understand the importance of that knowledge. The student is understood, that's why he's coming. But the parents invariably don't understand. What Vedanta Academy? What till you get there? A diploma? With a diploma, what job will you get? You won't even get a clerical job. They're only worried about job. Anyway, now I'm not going to details, but the, the, the boy is trying to put some sense into the father and uh, the parents, you know, and say, look, you know, this is what I want to do, this is my swadharma, this is, is logic and reason. It doesn't appeal to them at all. And they come, the fellow comes to me, Swamiji, I don't know what to do, please help me, I want to join the academy, but my parents are not allowing me. Now, what has happened? 
I told them everything. I told them what is swadharma, what is this, what is that. Re, you are going in the wrong direction. You will never get permission to come here. Then what should I do? Start crying. Huh? Stop eating. You know, these are all emotional appeals. And then the mother will go and tell the husband, he's not eaten for two days. You know, when I say stop eating, eat outside, I say. <laughs> Don't stop eating. Nicely have a meal outside and then say, I'm not eating. Huh? Actually, he's overeating out there. And then say, oh, the mother will go and say, oh, I don't know what to do with the boy, is not eating. The father comes and says, but why are you not eating? If I can't go to the academy, it's not worth eating. It's better, better to die. Huh? And then they will be talking, what will happen to it? And then every time you go, crying, all the time comes, sure, okay, go. You understand? So many people have done that. Now, I shouldn't say publicly because any fellow wants to join, the father will know that it's all uh, fake. <laughs> Simply cry, I said. So, you've got to talk the language. Now, Arjuna, uh, Krishna is crying with this man. He is trying that emotional appeal. You may ask me, how do you know? Because at the 24th verse, he is ready. He stirs, Arjuna has got up, and therefore he gives thereafter a blueprint of what right action is, a magnificent portion where he gives what is right action, and that you'll get after this emotional appeal is over, and Arjuna is ready to receive the knowledge. 20th verse. He says, two appeals he makes. Verily, by action alone, Janaka and others satisfied perfection. I'm sorry, attained perfection. Even with an eye of welfare of the world, also you should perform action. Therefore, he gives two appeals in the 20th verse. One is, he kindles his devotion. Arjuna was a devoted person. He had a lot of devotion. So he says, he harps on tradition. Look, Janaka, uh, etc. Janaka and others means Janaka, etc. And he doesn't spell out. He is he's talking about uh, Janaka, Ikshwaku, and uh, various others like Ashwapati. Uh, they all relied on action. So when he gave the logic and reason for action, he's not reacting. But when he said, look here, Janaka and others, he had a great respect for Janaka. They acted. Is that so? So it appeals to him. Secondly, he says, it's a persuasion. Look here. Even if you don't want to act, it's okay. At least for the welfare of the people, welfare of the world, righteousness, please, you've got to. Persuasion for the sake of the community. Use the word loka sangraha. For the, for the benefit of the loka people, you must work. This is the 20th verse. In the 21st verse, he says, Yad yad acharati shreshtaha tatta teva itara janaha sayat pramanam kurute loka sthadan vartate is one of the most famous verses, oft quoted. Make a note of this. And uh, those who wish to buy heart, at least a few verses, this is one of the verses. You have to buy heart. Because when you go and tell others, I, you know, last five days I've been listening to the Bhagavad Gita. And the fellow who knows nothing about Bhagavad Gita, he will say, Oh, yad yad acharati sreshtaha tatta deva itara janaha. He will say, what is that? <laughs> then he will know that for your teacher has not taught anything. He knows only that verse, but he doesn't know the meaning. So you also learn 
to by heart one or two verses, which I'll give you. You may not know the meaning, doesn't matter. Someday you will understand. He says, Yet yet acharati shreshtaha tattadeva itarajanaha. Whatever the leader charati does, others do. It's a gospel. It's not what he says, but what he does. Sayat pramanam kurte lokasthadan vartate. He says, whatever standard he sets, that the world will follow. Not only they'll follow what he does, but whatever standard. If he's 70% perfect, they will follow that. If it's 80%, then they'll follow that. Now, if the boss himself has his own timing, where the office is at, just because the boss is a boss, he comes at his own timing, and he can't insist on others keeping to time. If he wants discipline in the organization, he must be disciplined. Yet, yet uh, whatever the Shreshtaha, Shreshtaha means chief, superior, does, others will implicitly follow. So you, he's tickling his vanity here. He says, you are a Shreshta Purusha, you are a leader, so whatever you do, others will do. Whatever standard. Now, you want to get away from, from the battlefield, you want to run away, everybody will run away. You understand? Therefore, you are a Shreshta Purusha. Now, what Acharati means does. Acharati. So, whatever the rulers do, subjects will follow. Whatever the teacher does, students will follow. Whatever the parent does, the children will follow. I have heard so many parents, Swamiji, my children, you know, I, how much I tell them, you know, they are the most indisciplined, they don't care, they don't listen to me at all. And what discipline? Uh, the fellow is having a scotch bottle and he is drinking at, uh, till 11 o'clock in the night. You may ask me what I am doing with him. <laughs> no, the floor. no, because he has invited me for a meal and he is drinking and drinking. I have to have a meal at least. And he has got his own discipline and 11 o'clock he is drinking. And these fellows must be taught. They don't. If you don't follow the discipline, they are not going to follow. This is a common problem. See, when you want to uh, mold your children, it's not what you say that matters, but what you do. And the moment, in fact, it has a negative effect. The moment you advise somebody, they want to do the opposite. So you keep on giving sermons to your children. They will never listen. And you don't set the example. So the ideal way of functioning, if you want to train your students, you must set the example and not give sermons, not give lectures. I find every parent not setting the example and giving lectures after lectures to the children. Nothing will happen. Opposite will happen. So, yad yada charati shreshtaha tattadeva itara janaha. So, culture comes from the top. Remember, revolution from the bottom. Culture seeps from the top. Any revolution comes from the bottom. So if you want to advise your subordinates in any form, you got to lead the way. You got to not show the way, lead the way. Whatever you do, others will follow. Hmm. Tavyam. Treshu loke shukin chana Nana vaptam avaptavyam Varta eva chakarmani Here the fourth appeal, it's still the emotional appeals. The fourth appeal he's making is a personal appeal. A very interesting psychological, psycho psychological point. Now he says, O oh, Partha, Arjuna, there is nothing in the three worlds 
The world is just a poetic expression, nothing uh, that I need to do that has to be done by me, nor anything unattained that has to be attained, yet I engage my in action. Don't you see? I am acting. So unless, the, as he says, the leader does, others are not going to do. But I don't need to act. Krishna is telling Arjuna, I don't need to act. See, if you ask me frankly, all that I am doing in the academy, I don't need to do. The students have to do. But I am doing it because I've got to set the example. So if anything goes wrong, I tell them, look here, I'm getting up at four o'clock, what's your problem? Yeah. I'm eating this food, I know it is terrible, but I'm also eating it. So what is your problem? Now, if I am a separate, I'm having a separate food and they're complaining. No, there is no such complaints. I'm just uh, giving example, you know. Uh, some of you are working, uh, looking at me. Why are they torturing students like that? Nothing like that. <clears throat> so, I don't need to work. I am the Lord. I am Paripurna. I have nothing to gain, nothing to attain. Yet I am acting. So, therefore, you should act. This is a personal appeal. It's a very interesting psychological point. Personal appeal is, sir, uh, you go to meet a friend after a long time because you went for an appointment a little early. Say you had about an hour's time. So in that area, your friend is living, so he, he say, let me look, look him up because I have not seen and you have to spend that one hour. So he went, the friend says, hey, where are you? We haven't met for a long time. I'm glad you come. Come, 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 sit down, sit down, sit down. And you have a lunch meeting with that uh, business fellow. So he, was, uh, he comes and he was talking. After a while he says, listen, have a cup of coffee. He said, no, 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 I'm just going in for lunch. I had some time, I thought I'll catch up with you. No, no I know that, but have a cup of coffee, man. Uh, uh, honestly, I'll, sp uh, I'm, you know, I'm just going for dinner. I, I don't uh, wish to have. He said, uh, you know, my wife makes very good coffee. Are Baba, I know that I've had several times. I will, some other time I'll have, but not now. But uh, I will spoil my appetite. And uh, he says, yes, spoil, but have it. You understand? So uh, he goes on persuading. The last thing he says, look here, I am having. Why don't you join me? Ah, oh, okay. If you have, then I will join you. What is the logic there? All along, he's being, no, no, no. Suddenly, he makes a point, I am having, no, come on, you join. Invariably, he says, yes, if you are having, then I'll have. This is a personal appeal. It's a typical uh, psychological uh, trait. So, he makes that appeal. Krishna, uh, Arjuna, please understand that I am working. Therefore, you as a leader also must act now. Mm. 23. If indeed I do not ever engage in action, constantly, without a break, Men would follow in every way my path. Partha, now he introduces fear. If I don't act, nobody will act. You understand? He introduced, Sir, fear is the last thing that you do to correct a person. You don't start with fear. That's why he's towards the end. Now that the Arjuna is reacting, he, he magnifies that. 
See, when you train your children, it should never be through fear. Huh? In this country, unfortunately, children are brought up with fear. Not in the foreign countries. I remember my days in uh, a university in, I found in, the, in London that the policemen, you know, fellows with the helmet and tough guy, you know, all the fellows standing there. I've always found children coming to them. They go run and uh, I don't know what happens. Always two children will be there. If any children are there, they run to the policeman. This is not so in this country. Uh, if the child doesn't eat, I remember in Madras, I remember, same thing in Karnataka also must be there. If they say, hey, police car at one. Will you finish the food or not? Otherwise, I'll call the police, he said. Oh, okay, oh, oh, please, oh, oh, oh. Every day, police has to come to eat, uh, feed the children. Same thing in uh, Karnataka, I don't know what they say, Kannada. Uh, they are brought up with fear here. This is my background, police. And the children are going to the policemen all the time. It confused me for a while. Then one day, actually went and parked the car. And I went up to the policeman. He said, what's wrong? He said, now I want to know why children are always flocking with you. Oh, uh, that's for a reason, he said. Uh, we always carry sweets with us. The policemen carry sweets. So, Whenever a child comes, they give a sweet. Now you don't go and ask, because they adults they don't give. They give a sweet. Therefore, the children know that when you see a policeman, it's a free sweet they get. They go and ask, immediately they'll give. They don't have to go and ask. As soon as they go, they give. You understand? So fear is the last resort for correction. He made so many appeals, five appeals, nothing has happened. So therefore, he said, do you understand what will happen if I don't work? If I don't work, nobody will work, Arjuna. Huh? Abhi, huh? The moment he reacted, then he magnifies it into a threat. And that is the last one. Six. Machetaham. <laughs> These, now he gives the threat, fear, he magnifies the fear. These worlds will perish if I did not perform action. The whole world come to a standstill, will finish. We'll all be, uh, perish. We uh, you'll be, we'll be destroying, I'll be destroying the world if I don't work. I should be the cause of confusion of castes and should destroy these people. Confusion of castes means, <laughs> The Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra, there are four castes. These people uh, perform activity according to their Swadharma nature. So if the caste system was not followed, each one who does not follow his own Swadharma, you know what is happening. Each one, the seers, the Swamis have to follow their own Swadharma. You understand? If they don't follow, there is danger. So businessman has to got to follow his business. He, he has to do business. Business businessmen should not go to the Himalayas and start meditating. He can't, first of all. As I said the other day, if he goes to uh, Himalayas, he will start a Himalayan silk store. He, he, he will not. So, so it becomes terrible. Each one will be doing things which he ought not to do. There will be a complete confusion in the society and the world will come to a standstill. So first of all, understand, these um, 
class are not by birthright. You get ample evidence, uh, statement directly in the uh, uh, Shastras. It is said, there are three distinct gunas. Gunas means qualities that you are made, everybody is made up of. Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. Tamas is the lowest quality of inertia, lethargy, inaction. That is Tamas. Rajas is the state of frenzied activity. Activity with a lot of ag agitation. People running around like a chicken without a head. You're rushing, hurrying, worrying. This is Rajas. And Sattva is the highest state of the human mind where he is in poise, serene mind, contemplative, objective. That quality of the mind is called sattva. These are the three qualities that every one of you have. When there is a high content of sattva, objectivity, contempl co contemplative nature. When there's a high content, percentage of sattva is very high, you are a Brahmin. It doesn't matter whether you are an Englishman or an Indian or a Chinese or a Japanese, it doesn't matter. Whoever you are, wherever you are, if your contemplative and objective nature is very high, you are a Brahmin. This is the definition given in the Shastras. You got your own definition. You understand? And if the sattvic content drops and others pick up, then uh, Rajas particularly, you are a Kshatriya. Kshatriya means a warrior class. Brahmin class are those who have to teach, preach, guide the uh, ignoramuses, the masses. That is the job of a Brahmin. Now, uh, uh, then the Kshatriyas have to protect the country, they have to fight. And then the Vaishyas are the business people. When the sattvic content still falls, Rajas is still there, Tamas creeps up, you're a Vaishya businessman. Then comes Shudra, the menial, where the ha traces of sattva only are there. So these are four classes of person with distinct jobs to do. Nobody has given them. Automatically they take. If they don't perform their jobs, this is what he calls a niyatham karma. Your obligatory function, if they don't do, there will be chaos in the society. And I'll be responsible. If I don't do, nobody will do their jobs. And therefore, there will be utter chaos in the society. It will destroy the people. Therefore, if you carefully follow uh, 20 to 24, he has given six emotional appeals. First of all, devotion. Janaka and others did it. Great man. Arjuna was inclined to act, I mean, uh, consider. Then came persuasion. Look, at least loka sangraha, for the pe other people you must do it. Then vanity tickled and said, Yadyadacharati Sheshtaha Tattadeva Itarajara. You are a Sheshta Purusha. Whatever you do, others will do. And then personal appeal. I am working, Arjuna. Do you understand? Then he installed some fear, fifth one. And then a threat. He completed the picture. And then the assumption is, Arjuna is now ready to receive the knowledge. And therefore, he starts with the sermon of action. What is right action? A magnificent portion of the text is this. In fact, one of the best portions of the Bhagavad Gita, 25 to 35, is 11 verses. He gives the technique of right action, which starts with the next verse. O Bharata Arjuna, 
just as the ignorant act attached to action, you must act, the wise one act, acts unattached. Vidwan should act with detachment. Asaktaha, saktaha, attachment. Asakta, a in Sanskrit means non, non-attachment, with detachment. So, O Bharata, he starts off the very first verse giving you the prescription of right action. What is, the, what is right action? Just as the ignorant people, avidvam saha, avidvam saha, the ignorant people act with a lot of saktaha, means attachment. Whatever they do, they are terribly attached to action. If a sportsman is in the sporting field, he is attached to action. If a businessman is doing business, he is attached to action. If a swami is, uh, uh, starts an ashram, he is attached to the ashram these days. It is not so in those days. So anything anybody does, the ignorant people, foolish people get attached to action. They do it with a lot of attachment. So therefore, your thinking is, my wife, my children, my grandchildren. There's nothing wrong. I'm not asking you to give away your family. Where will you give? It's not that, but it's the attitude. Attitude is that you can't think beyond that. Can't think beyond your profession, beyond your family. That ruins your peace of mind. And then you, you don't understand what happens. As I said, it can go right up to bypass. And bypass, if it happens, there also you glorify. Bypass club, it is. people are formed. Huh? At least then you must wake up. What is happening to me? Yeah. People are paralyzed. People are because of tremendous attachment. Yeah. I was uh, walking in a park near my house uh, in Bombay. I take a walk there. Two fellows were following me all the time. I can see that, you know. Now if I start talking, walking stops, you know. Uh, so at least that time I, I keep walking very fast and they were catching up with me. Faster I walk, faster we can't jog in the park, you know, so otherwise I would run away from them. The fellows were following and uh, they are catching up very fast. I said, because if I start talking, uh, exercise goes. I can't afford it. So these two fellows says, Swamiji, we are your followers. I said, I can see that. <laughs> they are falling. I can see that. He says, no, no, Swamiji, we have never missed your lectures. We are great well-wisher of yours. We are great this thing. And, uh, he was telling me, and I was still walking, and he, they were walking fast, and then he said, I said, I'm very happy to meet you. And uh, uh, Swamiji, I'm telling you, we are great well wishers that I just want to have a. He says, uh, Swamiji, I, we would like to uh, find out from you. Uh, uh, I just have a query, and I hope you don't mind. No, no, you ask anything. I said, I've got the one query, let us finish. And uh, he said, uh, I'm just, we have, <laughs> Swamiji, we are well wishers. We have great respect for you, regard for you. I said, listen, all that is there, but what is the question? The question is, Swamiji, why are you walking? <laughs> I said, why are you walking? I said, I have answered question from Upanishad, from the Vedas, but why are you walking? I could not answer that question. Why are you walking? I said, I'm walking because uh, I can't say everybody is walking. I'm walking. Uh, why are you walking? Uh, I don't understand what you're asking. Swamiji, there are only two types of people who are walking in this park. I, we want to know what category you belong to. Oh, we are well, well wishes, Swamiji. What, are, what has that to do with walking and... Uh, you know, Swamiji, the, all the people who are walking here are, are being advised. They are walking either before bypass or after bypass. 
He is asking me, do you belong before or after? Are you going to get the bypass soon? Because the doctor said, if you don't walk, you'll have a bypass. After bypass also, they recommend a little walking is necessary. So which category do you belong? We are your well-wishers. Are Baba, I do not belong to any category. I'm a third category, no bypass. You understand? So, uh, attachment is a killer, actually. Even if it kills, they glorify that. Huh? So, ignorant people, avivdvamsaha, act with asakta. Vidwan, vidwan means wise person, acts exactly like him, without attachment. Now a sense of detachment, if you see Krishna's life itself, if you uh, read his history, nowhere is attached. Every part of it is a life of detachment. Once you're detached, you can do anything you like. No, don't start doing everything and then say, I'm detached. No, what I'm saying is he was with the gopis all the time. People couldn't understand. Life of perfect detachment. The bhaktas don't understand. So why is he with so many gopis? That we don't understand, but he is still Krishna, no? So, anything, anything he did, he has absolutely no attachment. The day he was born, he was taken away from the mother. And he, he, throughout his life, he never retraced his path. Perfect detachment is what he wants you to start doing. How do you do it? How can you get detached to what you are doing? By Wishing the welfare, loka sangraha, by wishing the welfare of others. If I'm attached, I'll be working only for myself. But if I'm wishing the welfare of the society, I'll be detached from selfishness. Now he says, very interesting advice he gives. Now that you people have learned something, let not the wise man unsettle the minds of the ignorance who are attached to action. <coughs> just because you have learned this, just to a superficial knowledge, book knowledge you have, then what do you do? Go home and give a lecture. My dear wife, you know what I learned, what Krishna is saying. Very wrong with what you are doing. From now on, no attachment. Hmm? I think you are attached. In a way, I think I am also getting attached. So best thing is pack your bags, go to your mother's house. <laughs> huh? Just because you learned a few sentences here, don't go and unsettle the minds of the ignorant. Just because you learned it, don't unsettle the minds. But acting united with the self, let him render all actions attractive. Then what should you do? You should live a life of detachment. And others will see you. What a life. Why is he so cheerful? Why is he so happy? Why is he so perfect? By looking at you, and you become an example for them to follow. So you never achieve anything through sermons. All that we are doing, as I said uh, in the last few verses, that you, are, you don't set the example when you give sermons after sermons, you are ready to give advices. Even your own children will reject it. Your own partner will reject it. I mean, they may be polite and keep quiet, but internally, they either externally, they blurt out and said, I don't care what you say, I will live my life. Or they'll protest, or silently uh, be uh, against your statement, whatever you say. So, <coughs> knowledge, just because you learned, you must be careful not to blurt it out. Learn, use that knowledge to change yourself. And once you change, automatically, they will come and take the knowledge. Remember, knowledge is never given, it's taken. 
one ought not to give lectures. Like Shakespeare says, give thy ear to all, but few thy voice. Give thy ear to all, but few thy voice. Don't be eloquent. For the simple reason, you may say, why not I give? Anything forced is not forceful. You say, why not give the knowledge? It, knowledge has to be taken. In the good old days, they kept it in the Himalayas, these great masters, and the students trekked through the jungle and tried to learn. So they got it from the masters. They didn't come and distribute this knowledge here. So knowledge is taken by the student, never given by the master. Or oh, when it is asked, he gives. Because once you force this knowledge on others, it's not forceful. Secondly, each one's vasana is manifest. Vasana means your tendency. How much you tell him, he will do the same thing. So it has to be gradual. So even the roads on which you travel, even a highway, you will never find a road suddenly turning right. It's always in a curve. If you don't understand that, watch the rivers. As they, have you seen any rivers in right angles? Right, left, right? No, it's always in curves. Any change is in curves. It is not abrupt. So therefore you can't bring about abrupt changes. So wise people should not unsettle the minds of the ignorant. Just because you know, just don't, you know, offload on others because they will not be able to take it because of their own vastness. Change has to be gradual. And moreover, they must be ready to receive the knowledge before you start giving them. We'll continue tomorrow.